Good, af good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's um, a little, uh, so I'm Andrew Saxon. I'm a professor in the department and I direct the Center of Excellence in Substance Addiction Treatment and Education over at the VA. So it's a little ironic that um, I'm introducing Susan, who works here and probably you all know, but uh, maybe there's some things about her that you don't know. Uh, and I, I, it's, I, it's really um, a joy for me to um, introduce uh, uh, my cherished colleague, Susan, who I've been collaborating with, Susan Collins, PhD, Dr. Collins. Uh, we've been collaborating about, since about the last decade. And uh, uh, she um, has trained in a lot of uh, different places and brought all that knowledge here to Seattle and our department. Um, and most prominently, she worked with Dr. Alan Marlatt, who some of you may know of, who was um, an icon in our Department of Psychology at the University of Washington. And he was really the person um, who realized that cognitive behavioral therapy uh, could be applied to substance use disorders and invented relapse prevention therapy that if any of you are working in addictions, I'm sure you use all the time. But in later stages of his career, he realized that wasn't enough, and he began to become interested in harm reduction because the, so many um, of the treatments for substance use disorders demanded abstinence and didn't work with realistic goals. And um, unfortunately, um, Alan passed away too young, but Susan has taken his ideas, expanded them, and really brought them into reality. And I have to say, tremendously influenced my own thinking when I trained in medicine. Um, we had a very paternalistic approach to patient care, which is the doctor knows everything and you tell the patient what to do. Um, and for any of you who have worked with uh, patients with substance use disorders, that is a very useless approach. Um, and, and Susan's um, ideas have really um, influenced me both in my research to try and develop harm reduction treatments for, for the groups of patients I treat, but also in my, my clinical work um, I found that I uh, approach patients in a diametrically different way, and it's so much more fun because um, I can celebrate the small successes with them um, on, the, on you know, what can often be a long path and small steps to recovery that are generated by what the patient's own goals are. So um, thank you, Susan, for the work you're doing. I'm excited to hear about it, um, and please take the floor. Yay. Wow, I'm so humbled. Um, I'm so, thank you for the kind introduction. Can folks hear me? It's, it's good? A little bit louder? Okay, I'll just hold it. Because it makes me feel like a rock star. You are, you can move around now. I can move around now. Um, so I'm also really humbled that so many people took time out of their day to come here and hear a little bit about the work we're doing. Um, it's very exciting to have so many um, kind faces, familiar faces in the audience as well. Um, and today we'll be talking about meeting people where they're at, um, about our uh, community-based development, implementation, and um, evaluation of harm reduction treatment for uh, people who use substances and who experience homelessness. And um, Andy was so kind to give me so much credit for things, but I really have to say that this work is definitely not my own. Um, I am standing on the shoulders of giants, um, and um, I also owe a great debt um, for today's uh, research that we'll be presenting to you, to our many partners who have been involved over the last 11 years of our work together. Um, I want to acknowledge the community members who are here who will be co-presenting um, with a moderated panel in the second half of this talk. Um, and also, I cannot um, not acknowledge my amazing um, partner in science, Seema Klippasepi, who co-directs the Harm Reduction Research and Treatment Center with me. Um, and so today, what I want to do is tell a little bit about a story about how Seema and I came to apply harm reduction approaches in our clinical practice and in our research. And to do that, I want to give folks a little bit of an idea of that journey. Um, we came to this work, um, I came to this work about 11 years ago when I started uh, working with Dr. Alan Marlott, a legendary pioneer um, in harm reduction research and treatment. 
Um, and it, he was uh, commissioned by the now late executive director of the Downtown Emergency Service Center, or DESC, to evaluate 1811 Eastlake, which is low barrier housing for people who have experienced chronic homelessness and uh, alcohol use disorder. And I started off as an interviewer on the ground um, there uh, 11 years ago, and I, I haven't stopped going back. Um, it feels... Um, I'm very, I feel very, very honored to be, um, to walk through those doors every time I do. Um, getting a little emotional. Oh my gosh, y'all. <laughs> it's not just about the research. Um, and so to give y'all, how many people are familiar with 1811 Eastlake in the audience? Okay, it's so good to see so many people who are aware of this amazing program. It is owned and operated by the Downtown Emergency Service Center, opened in December 2005 uses a single site housing first approach, which means that people's um, homes, their apartments, are located within a single building. Uh, residents are people who have lived experience of chronic homelessness many years on the street, as well as alcohol problems. And um, this particular um, housing program is not um, different from a lot of DESCs because they use a housing first approach generally, but it was uh, made specifically to address high utilization of publicly funded services, including the Harborview ER. Um, and the controversial piece about this in 2005 when it opened its doors was that residents were permitted to drink at their units, did not have any requirements of attending treatment, abstinence-based treatment, and um, also did not have to meet any cr uh, criteria for sobriety. This created controversy at first, um, but I think um, effectively our research started to dismantle the myth that um, housing uh, uh, should follow treatment. In fact, we learned it really is about housing first. And it's true that in that initial evaluation, we were measuring alcohol use and publicly funded systems utilization. Um, and it's true that people experience um, problems with alcohol there. But honestly, um, what impressed us the most about working there was people's resilience. Um, their stories um, that were you know, laced with humor, um, their strong uh, pride in their community um, and their cultural identity. Um, pragmatism and resourcefulness, so doing whatever it took to get by, um, paired with mental toughness, what we now know from the research is called grit, uh, physical hardiness, um, that really ensured that they would survive against all odds, and in fact, many people who live there, and many people who are, um, I'm, I'm happy to say, are in the audience with us today, um, and will be on the panel in the second half, um, told me over the years that they had out-survived many of their family members and their peers as well. So really, these folks are survivors, and these are uh, tales of triumph. And so I was, I awoken to then to the community's potential. Um, but as many of y'all know, um, in our conversations in this city about homelessness, potential isn't usually a part of the discourse. Um, when you look on Wikipedia under homelessness, the first thing that comes up is about what people lack. Um, and that's paired with a lot of myths and stereotypes about people who experience homelessness, that not only do they lack a home, but maybe they lack motivation to stop drinking or using substances. Um, there's a stereotype that people might lack interest in housing. Um, and what we found through our research is that's wrong. And I don't just mean morally wrong, although you could argue that as well. I mean, that's not what our research showed. So our research showed that when homeless people were offered housing, they wanted it, they maintained it, and their drinking and alcohol-related problems decreased. Um, and in fact, we saw in our research for every three-month period that passed when people were in housing over two, years, over two years after they moved in, their drinking quantity decreased by 8% every three months. Their experience of delirium tremens decreased by 30%, that's advanced alcohol withdrawal syndrome. Um, and alcohol-related problems decreased by 23%. Now, some people said, well, that must be because people had stability, and so they were more able to attend treatment. That is not what we found. In fact, so each row here represents an individual in our original evaluation. Um, and in fact, less than 40 or 47% of people reported attending treatment at least once in the past two years, but only one person was in treatment the entire time, although most people had not stopped drinking altogether. Instead, what we found was when people changed their alcohol use and their alcohol-related problems, it was because of their own motivation coming from the inside versus external pressures of treatment coming from the outside. 
In fact, when averaged over a two-year period, treatment attendance was actually associated with 23% higher uh, experience of alcohol-related problems. That makes sense when you think about it. The more people are experiencing problems, the more they may be motivated to go and get treatment because they realize it's too much even for them to handle or the more pressure they have from case managers or friends or family. But when we looked at what actually caused change over time, what actually drove people to change what they were doing in their lives and the problems that they were experiencing, it really was their own motivation. So on Bill Miller's Socrates questionnaire, which measures motivation for change, each one unit increase in intrinsic motivation was associated with a 3% decrease for every three months that passed in alcohol-related problems, 2.3 times higher odds of non-drinking days, 17% lower peak alcohol quantity, that's the highest amount of alcohol a person consumed in the last 30 days, and 19% lower typical quantity. So we took all that in, and the fact was people were getting better, but they were getting better without us, right? And that hurt a little, little bit. <laughs> Because it's like, wait, I've been doing this for a lot of years. I went to school and stuff. And um, why am I not important in this scenario? But once I got past my own ego uh, damage, um, I, you know, I, I really wanted to ask, what could I do to help? And so Seam and I um, actually asked ourselves, what could we do to help? And we thought, well, we really need to listen to the community because it seems like they have a lot of really good ideas. These stories of strength and resilience really inspire us they probably have better ideas than us. And we were really excited about that idea, but then we realized we didn't even know how to listen to the community. We had grown up as researchers who brought our own questionnaires into sites and asked the questions that we wanted to ask and apply treatments that we created in the ivory tower and then thought we could just drop into communities. Um, and so we realized we had to go back to school, and we did. Um, we went back to school and we took Bonnie Duran's really excellent community-based participatory research course in 2010. And there we learned that working with communities in a more equitable way means researching topics that are important to them. Um, it means involving community stakeholders in a more equitable way in research design and implementation and evaluation. It means recognizing that everyone brings expertise and unique strengths to the table that are important if we're gonna do research that's gonna be sustainable. Um, and in fact, that's really the point. It's about combining our collective knowledge and action to achieving positive, sustainable, and even transformative social change. So we've created a new research paradigm and it's a four phase paradigm um, that we've applied across a few different studies now. And in phase one, we decided the important thing is for us to listen to the community. And we do that now using uh, qualitative research methods, so interviews, focus groups, sometimes naturalistic observations and settings to understand the flow and how these settings work and how people interact. Um, and uh, so I wanna tell you all a little bit, I'm gonna use an example of an alcohol study that we did a few years ago called Harm Reduction Treatment for Alcohol. And I'll talk about the phase one findings from that well, I won't talk about all of the phase one findings. The first part of these interviews that we did with 50 people who have lived experience of homelessness and alcohol use disorder, um, we also talked to staff and management who, who serve these individuals, but I won't talk about that today. The first half of these interviews were, um, we asked people, what do you think about treatment for alcohol use disorders and what does that mean to you? And usually people were referring to 30-day inpatient, IOP, um, ongoing outpatient or aftercare treatment. And all of this was abstinence-based. Um, and in fact, in Washington State, by definition, publicly funded treatment um, is abstinence-based. Um, and so I won't really talk about these findings today because I wanted to keep it positive. Um, but the memo that we got that I sat through 50 times over and over again was, we're not doing a great job. Um, we're falling down on our job a little bit. And it wasn't that people don't like providers. People really appreciated providers and wanted to talk to their providers but there was a lot of feeling of um, that treat the treatment system had become another system of oppression in addition to the criminal justice system and our other systems out there that end up oppressing people and telling people what to do versus capitalizing on people's own strengths and helping them propel themselves forward in recovery. That's a brief summary, but I can send you the paper on that if you're interested. <laughs> um, so the second half of these interviews was, if you could redesign treatment in your own vision, if you were the boss and you could make it how you wanted it, what would that look like? 
And what we learned through that work was that 96% of people said they wanted their basic needs fulfilled. So um, this really spoke against the treatment first, housing second model. This really kind of helped us understand, firmed up our understanding that it really is about housing first and then um, other things can happen. 94% of people told us they appreciated harm reduction approaches over abstinence-based approaches. Some people called it out by name. Some people said things like harm reduction is the only thing that works. Other people would say things like, you know, I want treatment to focus on other things that are important to me besides my substance use. Um, I'm not, I'm more than just a substance user or more than just a drinker. Um, some people wanted to reduce their use or reduce their experience of substance related problems. Um, and this reflection that this more holistic reflection came up a lot in people's desire to engage in meaningful activities. So 84% of people said they wanted counselors and, and providers to encourage them to reconnect in meaningful activities and support them in those pathways. 84% um, of people also said they wanted to reconnect with meaningful relationships in their lives, um, ones built on mutual respect. And 66% of people said they wanted providers to support them on their own pathway um, to recovery, whatever that looked like. And so we came up with a infographic, if you will. It is a <laughs> rainbow pathway with a pot of bowls. Um, I know, sorry. Um, but basically this, oh, thank you, Jimmy. <laughs> I appreciate that because you're a graphic designer by trade. And so it means a lot that Jimmy Rosario just gave me some props for that. I appreciate that. Um, I didn't see the office. Oh, thank you. So um, I'm blushing now. Um, so what we, what we learned from the community in total was that people wanted to co-design recovery programs together with providers. Counselors should be non-judgmental and uh, compassionate. Abstinence or drinking reduction should not be required. Um, and we should support people's own steps towards recovery on their own timeline and in their own way. Um, we should help people elicit their goals and work towards those and offer different kinds of modalities and different kinds of counseling options to fit different people's needs. And of course, goals become very challenging then too. We have to have a much more differentiated and nuanced understanding of what our treatment goals once we take away the idea that abstinence from substances is the paramount goal. Once we take away that belief, we have to start thinking about, you know, it could be, you know, 50% of people we talked to said they wanted to achieve drinking and other drug related goals, but only 5% of those people wanted to achieve abstinence. So thinking about that in a more differentiated way, and then also incorporating other important goals that people really felt like they wanted to see happen for themselves. And so these findings highlighted to us as treatment professionals and researchers, the need for additional pathways to recovery. And from what we knew about our mentors' work, um, Drs. Mary Larimer and Alan Marlatt's work, um, is that harm reduction approaches provide um, alternative pathways to recovery. Um, and just as a, like a, harm reduction is a really big tent, right? So um, I'll talk about um, where we fit into that tent. But harm reduction is a, a large group of low threshold and user-driven set of compassionate and pragmatic approaches that aim to reduce substance-related harm and improve quality of life for people who are affected by substance use and their larger communities. The twist is that harm reduction does not require that people achieve abstinence or use reduction. And in fact, that's not even advised or a part of what we prescribe. As I mentioned, harm reduction is a really big tent. So um, when I mention harm reduction at a lot of trainings I do, the first thing people usually say is, oh, that's needle and syringe exchange, which is true. Um, but it's a lot of different things. So I'll talk about how harm reduction can be applied at different levels. I would say the broadest level is probably the policy level. So that would be a good example of that would be uh, decriminalization, legalization, and regulation of substance use, um, which we've seen has worked very well in Portugal for um, encouraging people to engage with treatment, um, has kept people out of the criminal justice system, and has actually discouraged kids from starting to use substances. Um, we've seen that de facto also work relatively successfully um, in the Netherlands. Um, and here in the United States, we're just starting to dabble in harm reduction proper when it comes to policy, but we're starting to see promising findings with that as well. It can also be applied at the population-based level. This is when you're trying to reach a large group of people with a harm reduction message. And my favorite example is, of course, the 1980s PSA, Friends Don't Let Friends Drive Drunk from MAD. Um, and basically, that's not saying you can't go to the bar on a Friday night and have some drinks. It's just saying if you do that, 
please don't drive home and endanger yourself and other people. So trying to help people use in a less harmful way. Then there's community-based interventions. So that would be things like safer consumption sites, um, which we will probably be talking about here in Seattle for the next 10 years, <laughs> we actually do. But, um, but it, it is an exciting idea, a way that um, substance users can use more safely because they have clean works, they have a more sanitary surrounding in which to use and have oversight in case they need help finding veins or if someone overdoses. Um, needle and syringe exchange is a perfect example of a community level intervention, also housing first. So interventions that are applied to communities and that help the larger communities around them as well. Um, of course, how we work in harm reduction um, is typically here at Harborview, if we're clinicians, providers, counselors, is going to be how we talk to people. So talking to people in a different way, and we've come to call that harm reduction treatment. Um, although not everything we do in the Harm Reduction Research and Treatment Center really fits the term treatment. So to give you a little bit of an idea, go back to our research paradigm, I wanna to talk to you a little bit about how we brought this expertise that we have with harm reduction um, to the community's expertise and what um, they wanna see happen for themselves and what they think is gonna be a successful way forward. And what we do is we pool this information together at meetings at a community advisory board with a community advisory board. Our community advisory boards, and we have, we've had three throughout time, um, comprise clients, uh, staff and management at community-based agencies as well as researchers and sometimes other community stakeholders. We typically meet monthly um, and the community advisory board works together to develop, refine, implement, and then evaluate our research procedures. Um, and then what we do is together we collaboratively disseminate this information as well as lesson lear lessons learned and that's what we'll be doing in the second half today um, with folks who have been uh, working with us. So again, to just give you an idea of what this treatment ended up looking like when our community advisory board sat together, um, people said unequivocally that harm reduction was going to be the best way forward. And at the time we were working with 1811 staff and management, and this is also very much a part of the DESC philosophy. Um, so that was a good fit. Within harm reduction, um, just to give you an idea of our stance as harm reduction treatment providers, the, we believe the relative risk of substance related problems is variable and individually based. So, so instead of telling people, look, this is gonna harm you if you do this at all, we um, play a more predictive role. We help clients assess what are the relative risks of different kinds of substance use um, behaviors and to move forward in a way that will help them reduce their substance-related harm and improve their quality of life. And within this model, as Andy said before, instead of the doctor knows best model, uh, we believe the client knows better. But I think the most important part of our work as harm reduction treatment providers um, is that is the heart set. Um, and I, I'm not alone in saying this, Ethan Nadelman, who is the late and great um, uh, founder of the North America Syringe Exchange said, he really did say, it's not about needle and syringe exchange, it really is about a set of attitudes and beliefs. Um, and I think he meant heart set. Um, we have an openness to the other and other's values. We don't judge people based on our own value system or try and impose our own values on, on, our, on our patients or clients or community members. Um, we uh, show compassion, and that is Latin for feeling with. So we feel with patients we're working with, um, with the desire to remove suffering, but at their own pace and on their own terms versus our own. Um, there's acceptance, acceptance for whatever walks into our office um, and, uh, and whatever, whatever you know, that day should bring, um, radical acceptance um, for things that we don't understand instead of fear. I think we talked about that yesterday too. Um, fear is, is quite um, prevalent right now in our society and we need to resist that, resist the dark side. <laughs> um, join the resistance. Um, and uh, pragmatism and flexibility. So this can mean many different things. For some people, this is meeting people where they're at in their homes and doing work there. For some people, I have a client who has TBI, and so he, multiple TBIs actually, um, and he uh, texts me what he's drinking because he can't remember for our next appointment. So he'll just text me instead. So it's about being flexible and meeting people where they're at, um, whatever that means for the work you're doing. And I would say those are hallmarks of any really good client-centered treatment, right? If we're truly doing client-centered care, probably that's, that's what it would entail. 
But where harm reduction goes above and beyond, and I can say this because Bill Miller and I have had conversations over the past couple months about this, I would say harm reduction really is more about transformative change. So helping people to create transformative change in their lives, um, really getting them focused on meaningful activities and what they're living for. Um, and it's also about advocacy. Um, and this can mean connecting people to awesome harm reduction um, associations where they can advocate for themselves in the community, like Vocal of Washington um, or uh, the People's Harm Reduction Alliance. Um, there are a lot of online, great online um, communities as well. But it's also about advocacy with our peers and what I call punching up. And um, I was going to provide an example of the calling in approach that we do with our peers to help correct stereotypes about substance users that we work with. But today I decided after hearing Attorney General Jeff Sessions statement before I came here, um, <laughs> that I would call out instead. Um, he said this morning that people who use marijuana are not good people. <laughs> I'm so mad, okay. This is why I'm really bad at calling in sometimes, okay. Um, uh, and he said, that's <laughs> transformation. It makes no sense. Well, I love that you say that, Jeffrey, because in fact, um, we have no research evidence that substance use, which is a behavior, is a moral stance, nor do we have any evidence that being a good person has anything to do with substance use. In fact, in the United States and around the world, good people use substances every single day. And that is a fact. Um, so I really, um, I would prefer that people in public office would refer to the wonderful research that's being done here at the University of Washington <laughs> versus their own particular moral stance on things. So that's an example of advocacy. This is going to be archived, just in case there's any confusion. The Harm Reduction Research and Treatment Center does not agree with a moral stance on substance use. <laughs> so, Harm Reduction and Treatment Center. So, what we're going to be talking about in August, I'm going to provide a full day training for clinicians here at Harborview, in fact, right across the hall in the auditorium, about specific components that you could use in your practice with substance users as well. These are not, um, these are not um, set when we work with communities. They change from setting to setting and depending on the substance. But for our harm reduction treatment for alcohol, um, uh, we decided together with community members that they were tired of um, providers typing into EHR. So we exploded the black box essentially and now we work with uh, patients to help them select their own metrics about what's important for them to track in treatment and we uh, track that collaboratively together. We work on eliciting participants' own harm reduction goals, or in this case, patients' own harm reduction goals, and help them to uh, remove barriers to achieving those. And we discuss safer use strategies, so how people can stay safer and healthier even if they choose to continue using substances. And this is important because talking to people in a different way about their substance use really will allow us to do um, clinical work that's more congruent with the really fantastic medications that are currently available to help substance users reduce harm, right? And let's think about keeping our, the way we talk to patients congruent with the medication and its purpose. For example, naloxone isn't meant to get people sober. Naloxone is meant to keep people alive. Uh, uh, opioid substitution is not meant to keep people off opioids. It's meant to help people use opioids in a safer way, in a way that they can reconnect with meaningful relationships and activities in their lives. Um, and e-cigarettes, for example, we're starting to use as a means of helping people use nicotine more safely um, so that they aren't hurting themselves with the combustible effects of cigarette smoking. So going back to our research paradigm, before I call our community members up to, to correct me on any parts of the process I've gotten wrong today. <laughs> I don't know where. Um, <laughs> I'm sure Jurgen's out there somewhere, though. So. Um, so for phase three, I want to refer. I want to refer to some of the findings of the studies that we've conducted based on this community-based participatory research approach and harm reduction. So our harm reduction treatment for alcohol study actually happened down here at Pioneer Square. Uh, Pioneer Square. Sorry. The, Pioneer Square Clinic. Thank you. Nigel was one of our interventionists there. Seema did some interventions at Evergreen Treatment Services REACH um, office, and we also worked at DESC's drop-in center. 
Um, and in that study, we found that people with lived experience of homelessness and alcohol use disorder experienced a 71% reduction in alcohol-related harm, 66% reduction in peak alcohol consumption, a 63% reduction in AUD <laughs> symptoms, and a 20% reduction in positive urine tests, even though, again, we weren't going for abstinence as a thing in this study. Now, that was over a three-month treatment and follow-up period. This was an initial study. We need to do uh, later studies with longer follow-up periods. But what you can see is not only does harm reduction not make people use more, that's oftentimes clinicians are worried, if I, if I don't insist on abstinence, people's substance use will get out of control. Actually, we found that it does decrease substance use, and we did have about 5% of our people in that study also become abstinent. Does not preclude abstinence. We're behind whatever goals people have for themselves. When we combined a harm reduction approach with uh, extended release naltrexone, which helps to reduce alcohol craving, we saw that indeed it reduces people's craving and people experience a 60% reduction in alcohol-related harm, a 34% reduction in their peak alcohol consumption, which is the time at which they're probably experiencing the greater, greater experience of alcohol problems. And we saw that that was biochemically validated, so a 91% reduction in, in um, ETG to creatinine concentration. So that's the alcohol metabolites that are excreted in urine. Um, we're doing a, a larger trial of this right now, a four-arm randomized control trial that Andy is actually one of the co-investigators on at the Sobering Center. And we've been working there for over five years. It's been such a pleasure um, to do that work there. Um, and I know that it's connected a lot of people to things that they really wanna see happen in their lives. And finally, our most recent harm reduction treatment study proper um, was at the shelter. Um, it was a, a single-arm pilot study with 44 people at the shelter um, who were smokers. And um, basically, uh, Joey, who is here, um, who is our community consultant, and Nigel, um, everyone had lived experience of smoking and NRT use and e-cigarette use as well. They would talk to folks at the shelter about how to use nicotine more safely and then teach them ways to do that and talk about what people's own smoking-related goals were. And in that study, we saw a 45% reduction in people's subjective experience of cigarette dependence, so they felt less dependent um, when they converted to e-cigarettes in particular, 29% reduction in smoking frequency, a 78% reduction in smoking intensity. And we provided both NRT, nicotine replacement therapy, and ENDS in that study, which is electronic nicotine delivery uh, system. Uh, so generation two, second generation vape pens, really. Um, and ENDS users were really the only ones to achieve abstinence, um, and they experienced above and beyond just the passage of time. It reduced smoking intensity at 44% and um, far less uh, cigarette dependence compared to people who used NRT or nothing at all. So what we're finding is these harm reduction tools can really help us as long as we're talking to people in a harm reduction way and using these tools, it can really help people reduce their substance related harm. And this is part of a much larger harm reduction programming effort that we're um, working on in the heart lab or heart center, I should say. Um, in this center, we have um, classical treatments like heart A, which is what I currently do in the outpatient mental health I'm an addictions clinic. Um, I use Heart A with my patients there. Um, HARP, which is what our primary study physician, Mark Duncan, uses over at um, Roosevelt Clinic. Um, and Heart S, which we're trying to work on um, follow up studies for that now. Um, but now we're trying to expand beyond that. Oh, and opioids, we're working on that as well. Those are all treatments and treatment settings proper. But we're also working on. Um, different kinds of settings. So for example, combining um, harm reduction philosophy with um, the native tradition of talking circles. We're working on a study for the next five years of that um, with the Seattle Indian Health Board and in partnership with Partnerships for Native Health at WSU. And um, Sean Buffalo Meat and Lavella Black Bear are community representatives on that, that community advisory board who are with us here today as well as well as LEAP, which is maybe the mothership of our programs because we've developed so many of these programs through the Life Enhancing Alcohol Management Program that Seema heads up through her K award. Um, and so, and I have to say we're riding high on that because we had an art gallery opening last night where many um, artists who are here today also presented their work and had their work purchased. Um, so really connecting people with meaningful activities in their lives, things that bring them purpose, and then um, you know, ensuring that they're recognized for that in the community is a big part of recovery as well as traditional treatment modalities. So with that, I want to invite um, my collaborators from the community, as well as Nigel, um, to come up here. And I thought for the second half, we could have a moderated panel. 
so that um, community members who are part of our community advisory board can, can talk about their experience of co-creating research with us at the Heart Center. Everyone's like a little hesitant to come up here. I you notice. Come on up. Come on up. And I don't know how many chairs we need, but we can. Um, we got chairs. Okay. okay. I grabbed different chairs. Okay. Um, so, I wanted to start off the panel by asking a question because I have the prerogative to do that with the microphone. Um, I wanted to um, maybe invite uh, Will and Joey, um, if y'all might be able, Will Williams and Joey Stanton are two community consultants who worked on our harm reduction treatment for smoking study, um, which is kind of our most recent research effort in this in this pathway, and I was hoping maybe y'all could talk a little bit about what it was like to be involved on a community advisory board and to co-create this, this approach with us. Uh, let's see, my name is Grover Williams, uh, I hope I will. Uh, for me, participation in the community advisory board was a big learning experience for one, uh, but uh, as a member of the homes community, it also gave me an opportunity to present from a perspective that sometimes doesn't seem to be paid as much attention to as you would hope or like, and that's the perspective of the person that's actually needing the service. Uh, I came in with an idea of what we were going to do and what we were going to create, but by the time I left, I learned more than I ever thought uh, I would from the experience. So uh, I apologize, I'm a little carried today. Thank you very much. Hey, Phil, Joey, do you want to add to that? Yeah, it was, uh, and also as a treatment, as a provider of the treatment, since you did both. The most fun that I had with it was sitting in the ivory tower and <laughs> uh, coming up with questions. <laughs> Because every time that they ask me to come to these things, I always talk about the questions. So we can use the mic, just so the people uh, who aren't here. Right. <laughs> the, 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 the questions. Okay. Do you want the mic? No. <laughs> Was the questions, and I mean, I don't know how many of y'all sit in the ivory tower and get to write questions. Okay. But those questions, for the most part, in the past 30 days, if that's in any one of your questions, cut the heck up. <laughs> if you can't glean information from me about what I'm doing, about where I'm at, and you need to know what I smoked for breakfast, what I drank for dinner, or what I shot into my arm to make it through the day. You're not asking the right questions. You're definitely not asking them at the right time. Because if you can't figure out a way to connect with me as a human being, there's not a piece of paper in the world that's gonna be able to do that. And I really took, I mean, you can ask them. I fought with the, these guys hard <laughs> over questions over what, you know, what are you really trying to fucking ask, excuse me? What are you really trying to ask? What do you want, what do you really want to know? And then it was like, like Will said, the, the I mean, I'm honored, man. I, I have no idea coming into this, what I would learn. And I am honored to, to be able to say thank you very much, very, very much. So it was fun, man. I got to sit in the outer tower and make up questions. <laughs> <laughs> but you did, but Joey, you did more than that too, yeah, because you um, not only helped us with that, but we decided this was the first study where we actually had a community consultant become an interventionist. Yeah, that was kind of scary. <laughs> <laughs> that was, I, I, but it was a lot of fun, and and, and I felt that, you know, I, I'm pretty good guy, so I'm pretty open to talk, you know, but I could see the apprehension. 
and the, the, the tension that was in the room, even with me sitting there. And I'm like, hey, man, I'm, an, I'm, 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 I'm formally homeless, whatever, man, however you want to put it, I'm one of you. And when still there was that thick air, for lack of a better word, and it was very thick. And, and, and it wasn't until getting very human, like teaching someone how to use a vape pen, hmm. you know, and explaining to them, do you, what was the first thing that happened when you smoked your first cigarette? What did you do? You coughed. Everybody did. And the way that we got people, I got people to try it, and this is about as un-ivory tower as you can get, is I told people that, this shit's gonna make you cough. What did you do after you had your first cigarette? You had another one. Did you cough then? A little less. The same thing's gonna happen here. And that was that blew me away that somebody wasn't grabbing me by the neck and saying, man, shut up. You know, what are you trying to tell people? Oh, the truth. Oh, it's just the truth. So it was an absolute pleasure. There you go. I hope that answered your question. <laughs> Thank you. so I just want to provide some context really quickly. Um, so the, the thing is, like, I think one thing that we've been doing that's not so great as clinicians is that we haven't been telling people the whole story when it comes to safer nicotine use. And that, um, you know, there's a lot of public health misinformation out there. There was a billboard behind my house. You see this on the buses saying that, you know, essentially implying that e-cigarettes are just as dangerous as smoking. If y'all seen those, you know what I'm talking about. Technically, all the information is correct but it's phrased in such a way that makes people really scared to try it. I think that's what Joey was referring to, is trying to help people tell people the truth about what we understand about relative risks and not assume the traditional provider stance that they can't handle the truth, right? Um, and so really trying to help people have a more differentiated perspective on that. And I really appreciate it. I think the fact that you were able to do that really broke through um, maybe their usual hesitancy in talking to providers about that. So thank you, Joey. Um, I would love to hear from um, maybe LaBelle or Sean, do you want to speak to your experience, um, maybe your more recent experience? We just started the harm reduction treatment or the harm reduction talking circles study, and I'm wondering if you'd like to share a little bit about your experience on that community advisory board. Uh, <clears throat> the experience I've learned is that it's a new uh, approach for Native Americans that have. Um, mental issues that involve addiction, uh, mental issues that involve drug use, and uh, habits that have been brought down from maybe influences in school, influences from family, and uh, it, it's a really uh, family-orientated, uh, I believe, uh, subject. I, as an adopted child, learned to uh, bounce off of other people, so to speak, learning how to eat right, how to behave right, how to speak right. And um, it's an ongoing uh, issue to uh, try to get in that circle because it's personal. And that personal area is uh, very, very hard, like a hard egg shell. And to open up and say, hey, okay, I'm here, I do need help, it's not easy. And it's not going to be easy no matter where you look at it. And every person on the planet, you know, has a shell, has a protection zone. And they like that enjoyment of a cigarette. They like that enjoyment of a beer. They like that enjoyment of substance abuse. It takes away, it desensitizes their feelings of their pain and depression and depression, that psychological bearing of uh, living in life. Every time I look at these skyscrapers, I, I didn't realize, you know, it's a whole different plane. Each plane is a different level. And it's like another city, another uh, community, another culture, whatever's going on. And this interracial culture of people have traditions. They have cultures, a way to deal with things. And there are natural medicines that have occurred throughout the thousands and thousands of years. Native Americans weren't given rights to have their uh, wellness societies as sweat lodges, uh, peyote meetings. They were not recreational. They were spiritual events that occurred with great spirit, 
the entities of God and water and nature. We prayed for the animals. We prayed for the sky. We prayed for the water. We prayed for everybody who needed help. That was the intent, and it's still the intent to this day. So my prayer and hope for the heart program is to learn nature by who we are. Number one. Number two, who we come from. Number three, what we have to do to work together as a partnership of Native Heart uh, Health and everybody else in the world. Our prayers for that, not just us. Maybe they'll learn from us because we learn from you. The leak started it, and uh, I'm proud of it. Thank you. Thank you so oh, <laughs> Maybe we could pass it down, and um, anyone who wants to take the mic could just comment on what they think about harm reduction treatment or the harm reduction programming we do or um, working with uh, Seema and me and other researchers at the University of Washington and the community-based participatory research process. Good afternoon. My name is Labella Black Bear. I am from the Lakota Nation, Oglala Sioux Tribe. And when I first met these ladies, Seema and Susan, I seen them running in and out of 1811. <laughs> they'd be running in and then they'd be running out. And I was thinking, who are these women? <laughs> what are they doing, right? All this time, they had this thing going in there. But see, somebody volunteered me to be on the uh, lab advisory board, and I didn't even know I was on the board <laughs> until way later, right? And, and then I found out what it was about. And then I started figuring out, you know, what this uh, harm reduction was. And um, when I first moved into 1811, I was really using alcohol a lot. But upon like seeing for myself who I truly am and accepting for myself, you know, gosh, you know, like I really can change. And today, I have beer in my refrigerator that I haven't drank in days and days, but this beer is for people that need it in the building. But I don't want these guys to know that because I don't want them <laughs> knocking on my door. Yay! Yeah. <laughs> But, but we really need, you know, I was a teenage alcoholic from the beginning when I first drank alcohol, I knew that I would never be the same. I have a son and I have a daughter, but their fathers never drank. I have never, ever been with an alcoholic. And yet, I suffer from alcoholism. I don't know how I wound up with all these men that were non-drinkers. But I'm not with them today. I'm single. I choose to be single. Because, you know, I made men suffer. You know, and that's not fair to men. You know, I as an Indian woman have to have respect for myself. And, you know, and being, uh, being like, I'm not alcohol free, but I know that I do not have to drink if I choose not to. And I'm happy. I am happy. And I feel free. I feel free from alcohol. I no longer have to shake. I no longer have to get out there and panhandle and go look for a drink. Today, I am free from that, and I am a happy woman. I am a blessed woman. I am blessed to know you all and to be able to work with the lab 
and also the harm reduction. And I thank you. Have a blessed day. Thank you, Isabella. I'd like to say one more thing about the heart, please. Um, also, this learning experience with the heart program has allowed me to, uh, at will, share this information with other people. <laughs> and by starting a network of this hidden information of heart, because it's not open yet. Uh, the advocacy, I want to learn and have learned from the heart program as well as the LEAP program, has made me a student. Uh, has made me educated in the manner of the, the way they have uh, processed this whole uh, procedure of things that's growing and it's so strong right now it's got roots now and the learning experience of all of us at 1811 has been uh, a harm uh, reduction of alcohol use uh, assistance and I give thanks to heart thank you I forgot to mention that. <laughs> Oh, and there's the Indian relay races at Emerald Dams all weekend. <laughs> I, I, so I'm going to hand it down to event. I want to hand it down to Will in just a minute, but before I do that, you know, Sean, you just you kind of said some really nice stuff about about harm reduction and about us and stuff. Can you share though what you felt when we had the NCARE kickoff meeting? Can you talk about sometimes how researchers don't don't get it right right <laughs> there is the um you know understanding that academic uh, uh positions uh have a purpose i felt like as well i'm not an academic uh position but i'm a part of uh, the program that's being focused on and i didn't know where i was uh, going to be a part of that but I am, as well as Lavella, as well as all of us here in the front, have uh, every right to be examples. And that's what we are. We want to share with you who we are, what we go through, and how it is, how it really is. And it's not easy. It's not perfect. But it's an effort from your part, and we want to inform you more. I think we volunteer on our own time and get a uh, you know initiative of being welcome here and being thanks uh, giving thanks to say you know hey we appreciate you and that's the best i could say on that part but to be more academically involved it's been an educational effort on just learning from what uh, is going on step by step so I think it's a community effort that we're all working together. I, and I want to be, we want to be as important to this program and uh, objective as you are. Thank you. And that, I, we got some really good feedback after, because sometimes as academicians and treatment providers, we forget, we use a lot of jargon and we have meetings that mean a lot to us. So when we involve community members, we have to do so in a meaningful way where they understand what's happening. We need to make space for their way of communicating and not just assume that everyone speaks our language. So it's about applying cultural humility to <laughs> our work with community members, both I think in our clinical work, we have community advisory boards, but also in research as well. And Sean and Lavella gave me some very good feedback after one of our meetings that they didn't know what was going on and they didn't really feel like they were we were reaching out well enough to involve them in the conversation. And I think that's one of the true um, honors that I have is that y'all feel like you can tell us that and, and um, you know, correct us when we're, when we're making mistakes. And I feel like that trusting relationship, I'm just very grateful to you for that. Um, and we have to constantly do better, um, you know, as, as people um, in the research world to better involve community voices in the work. Hi there, uh, Grover Williams again. Uh, I was thinking about time that I spent in recovery, and I remember we, uh, one of the slogans they talked about was progress, not perfection. You hear that all the time, looking for to make small improvements. Uh, small improvements are better, were better than no improvements. Uh, one thing that I was told by one of my sponsors that you wouldn't really generally hear around the rooms, if you come down to killing yourself, or taking a drink, take the drink, because at least there's a chance you'd come back from the relapse, but you can't come back from taking your own life. 
Now, how that relates to harm reduction, uh, I'm thinking, yeah, yeah. Uh, when it comes down to choosing the lesser of two evils, uh, having, the, uh, having the ability to, for instance, uh, find safer ways to intake your nicotine. Uh, I know, I apologize. Uh, I'm sorry, that was just uh, the closest analogy I could come up with to kind of describe to you what harm reduction means to me. Uh, having the opportunity to still get the need met, uh, whatever your addiction be, uh, food, caffeine, alcohol, uh, in a safer manner uh, is definitely better. Much, it, uh, having the, that alternative rather than to just be told, stop cold turkey. Some people just the idea of giving up something that they've been addicted to for so long is so overwhelming they won't even consider it. However, one might consider it stepping down in small doses uh, in a much more general manner. All right, once again, I apologize. I'm not a public speaker, but thank you very much. That was amazing, Will. Thank you. Um, Roger, did you want to add something to the discussion? Um, yeah, I'm Roger, and uh, I'm part. I'm on the, the LEAP advisory board and I'm part of the art collective. Uh, we had our art show last night. It's kind of cool. Um, it was, it was kind of cool. It's just it's just fun to be out in the community and feeling like something besides the bomb, which I did that for a lot of years. And the LEAP advisory board has helped me, um, even though I'd had a job for four years right before I got on it, um, it's, it's helped me get more connected with the community I live with. And the harm reduction for me when I moved into 1811, I, I moved, finally I moved into a building where I didn't have to be sober for, I didn't have to be sober. And that for me, that for me, that meant a lot. Uh, it meant that I was accepted. It's, it's that simple for me. And the LEAP advisory board makes me feel like I'm part of the community. That's how it is for me today. Hello. Welcome. Hello. I'm not used to microphones, but anyway, let's rather. Uh, the first thing I would like to say is Susan, as they call her, Susan, that's your Dr. Collins. Okay, thank you. She's not going to like it when I call her Dr. Collins. Uh, Dr. Pepisevi? Okay. And now, Susan, I know who you blew away. The person that taught you, and I can't remember his name. <laughs> these, are what, these are what brought me here. These two ladies and that man. Have, have, the first time I ever met that man, I haven't really met him yet. There was a, meet a few minutes. I know, I can, I'm going to meet you, believe me. I've been working with these two ladies for two more years. Hey, there was a time. And then paid simple. And I'm first saying I'm supposed to be running my audience. Okay, you guys are trying to learn and you're listening. And one thing I can tell you that you might not want to forget, please do learn the three L's. Listen, learn continually. And don't forget the last one that's most important this is love. We love people. We help people. It's very hard work. These two ladies have came up with a wonderful idea to even shock their professor. And I love to fight with professors. And what was the question I was supposed to answer? I don't know. I forget. I asked my professor. Okay, I feel like I'm in class right now. No, you're not. Hey, there was a time though. And I, even though I don't like my voice, I'm a musician. I have a face around my neck. So I'm on stage right now. I want a cordless mic. I'll talk to Susan. I want a cordless headset where I could have my hands. Uh, there was a time though, and true story, where I tore this thing up in front of Susan and said, What does this fucking thing mean? This bullshit. What is this this study that I have yet to fill out? I'm not going to tear it up with me. I'm going to fill this out. No, I'll leave it this blank. 
but what do I think of studies and harm reduction? Oh, but just listen and learn and love harm reduction and saving people's lives. There's many people we lose that we don't have anymore. This is life and death, really. Uh, so no, I will not tear this up. You know why? Because this fucking works. I'm graduated from San Diego State University. I haven't lived here in Washington. Now I'm at University of Washington. Mm. With two food. Yeah. Now, how did I go from the emergency room right across the street for months? Lost my foot for part of it, whatever. And a whole bunch of other things being homeless. How did I wind up from the emergency room to but what is this? A training place? What building am I in? And uh, teaching somebody something? How did I come up from the emergency room to the training room? Figure the fuck out. They can prove it. I think it works. Yes. Yes. yes, yes I know we're running. You need to book another hour for your grandma. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> there is so much lived experience in this room, and I, I know that there are a couple more people who wanted to say something, but I want everyone who needs to leave to get a chance to do that. and. And um, I'd love to have Nigel, who's one of our nurses, say what it's like to do this work from um, the nurse's perspective. And also, Joey, I think you wanted to say something as well. And I'd love to close out on you if that's okay. But anyone who has to go, please feel free. I know that we were booked for an hour. And thank you so much for your attention today. I'm not the greatest public speaker either, but I think everyone's really excited that we have people in a way that we can really work with nursing home providers and just is quite listening to people. And, you know, when I was an inpatient nurse for, you know, seven years, I mean, you kind of start, you know, going through the motions and your like protocols, and, and you really lack that time to stop, like, listen and really hear people. I think what I really learned here is having that time to really be able to do so has really changed my perspective and my perception. Um, I think that we're always, as you know, medical personnel, we're always looking for, we're always, we want to know what those outcomes are. We want those outcomes to be good. We want to find the best ways to educate our patients. I think the only way to do that is to start listening to them. Once you open up those doors of actually communicating rather than telling them, they're actually going to be able to, to listen. They're going to be willing to listen more, and then you can really break that ice. And it's really interesting to see how, when people come back and, and we rediscover kind of like the safer use strategies, how much they've learned and they can tell me like in a week, and how much that can change. And it's really sometimes almost miraculous that without asking someone to change at all and then developing their own goals, how much reduction has actually occurred, how much quality of life has improved for them as well and you see it on a day-to-day -day basis some of those first encounters can be very difficult and challenging because they're meeting the man they're meeting the authority they're meeting the person that's going to tell them what to do and they're like yeah what's that like and you hear that and then but after a little bit of time and after a couple of encounters you see that people really are listening and, and you're they're they're seeing that they're being heard i think really the testament is in everybody that's been up here speaking on this panel and everybody i've ever encountered during the interview, like in the interview, I think it's all really the survivors. So, I mean, I'd like to say more, but I think the group is going to be putting in harm reduction works and it's changed my life and I'll never go back from it ever. So, thanks to all of you and all your work on this country. So. Thank you, Nigel, and thank you for all your hard work. And, Joey, can right. you close us out? All right. Hey, everybody. Um, <laughs> one, one thing that that, that, that Nigel said I really wanted to cover it, and he did, but he did it much, way more gently than I will <laughs> probably ever. And, and that is the, a thing called the power in my mind. And I, I went to the seventh grade and I'm fucking proud of it. Right? <laughs> it's a power, a power dynamic. <laughs> so, uh, no, no, really. I mean, all jokes aside, the, the the power dynamic that's in place between provider and me is huge. It, it took me an awful lot of years. First off, man, when we come into your office, 
we're sitting there, we're like, how the fuck do I tell this guy what's really going on? How do I tell this person that I don't want to be alive? That my parents did unspeakable things to me. That I don't give a fuck. How do you break that barrier? And now I will tell you what, the way things are in place now, it's not working. There's a power dynamic. That's, you know, everybody can dismiss it as just one of those things. It's just a power dynamic. Well, it needs to be addressed in my mind. In my mind, I, you know, I, I am really amazed at what my life has become. I have a job here. <laughs> Shut the fuck up. Okay? Really? I have, I have a relationship with my daughter. I'm leaving for New Orleans a week from Monday for a month to be with my grandson. Oh my God. And you know, and I'm not gonna say none of this would have happened without Susan and Seema, because that would be bullshit. <laughs> what happened was is people started talking to me like human beings. People started talking to me and asking me what I wanted, what my goals were. What well, says, Susan, what was my goal? Come on. Teach the world to sing. Say that louder. Teach the world to sing. That's right. Do you know why? Do you know why I use that? Because I was scared because I didn't have a goal. I did not know which way was up, sideways, or wrong. I wanted to be alone. I wanted to fucking die. And it was none of your fucking business. Thanks for caring. Kiss my ass. Sign my paper. I'm out. And it, 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 it takes a few minutes to get past that word again, the power dynamic. We're all threatened by power, all of us. Somebody come up, I point in his face, I'm a guarantee he's not gonna like it. I point in your face, if I call you a name, or if I just, oh man, that whole power dynamic. When people show up, you know, what gets me, man, and I, I still see psychiatrists, go figure. Okay, I still see him, therapist, psychiatrist, and I talk to them, and I was like, well, what do you do when somebody shows up at your office and they smell like alcohol? And they tell me, I reschedule them. And I tell them, you're a fucking asshole. <laughs> Period. Why? Why do you, what, what's, what's off, what's, where's the skin off your back, man? What? Who told you that? That that's okay? They, 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 they don't turn sick people away from hospitals. You know, if you're bleeding, at least they'll stitch you up. At least listen to you for a minute. Oh, we're going to have to reschedule. My favorite, my favorite, my favorite one is, you're not doing well, way up. You don't look like you're doing well today. And I haven't even heard that from them, and I've never touched on that. How the hell do you know where I'm at? But I'm crazy, so don't, don't take my shit for gospel, because I am nuts, <laughs> and that's okay. That's okay. But I, I have been educated in a power dynamic i can't have a normal life anymore i can't because now i see it now everything almost everything i go through every situation every relationship every internet every, every interaction that has anything to do with life and all that and moving on you know uh, from work to what you're doing to music to everything it's all there's powers involved from parenting grandparenting all of it it's all power. And when we start using power to try to help people, that's when it gets really messed up because I don't, I, I won't trust you. I, I didn't trust you. I'm not going to trust you. And I think a lot of people feel that way, that, that are scared that I want to fucking die. I want to die. That's where I, I mean, I wasn't saying that out loud, and I probably, but that's what my actions were doing over and over and over and over again, and I couldn't figure it out. Now I've learned that it's what I put in my body. That, but that again is my decision. It has nothing to do with your goddamn morals. That has to do with my decision to do what I want to do. But harm reduction, if you're really serious about it, Question policy, number one, policy. 
Do not allow yourself to become policized. I made that goddamn word up. Policized. Y'all take it. Take that word with you. Policized. The next time you find yourself saying, I can't do that because it is against uh, <laughs> policy. And then start asking, why is that policy? What would work better? Maybe we can see people that are, oh God forbid, under the influence. Maybe we can see people that are substance users. Hmm. So, but anyway, hey, it's been fun, guys. So, <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you so much, and thank you, panelists, for like answering folks' questions that you didn't know you had. Um, thank you very much for being here.